Uh, good evening. I'm Stuart Pavlak. Uh, I'm the executive director of the ZOA in Pittsburgh. And welcome to Zoom with ZOA. I'm in my 12th year with ZOA, and it's an honor and a pleasure to represent ZOA. Prior to that, I spent just short of 16 years with State of Israel Bonds. So you can see that I love working indirectly for Israel and the, and the Jewish people. ZOA has been on the forefront of advocating first for the rebirth of the Jewish homeland and then in support of the State of Israel for over 120 years. We have also led the way in fighting Israel bashing on college campuses and fighting anti-Semitism. Under the direction of Jonathan Ginsburg, ZOA's campus department hosts at 150 colleges during, host events at 150 plus colleges during a normal year. Our government relations department and its director, Dan Pollack, educates U.S. senators and representatives on issues important to the Jewish community in Israel. And Susan Tuckman, director of the Center for Law and Justice, has had great success in getting colleges and universities to comply with federal law to protect Jewish students. ZOA is known to be unrelenting in our ideals and often by ourselves in taking difficult but correct positions as we are doing now with sovereignty in Judea and Samaria. And the Jew hatred and anti-Israel positions that we have seen in protests in American cities the last few weeks. The British columnist Melanie Phillips recently addressed weak positions that the Jewish community was taking in response uh, to uh, popular anti-Israel positions in Great Britain. And she said, that's partly because there is no Br British equivalent to the Zionist Organization of America, whose support is generally far more robust, uncompromising, and outspoken than the circumspect positions taken by America's other mainstream communal bodies. Later, there will be time for Q&A. Please post your questions by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of your screen. We will try to get to as many as we can. Please, we must ask you for questions only. Other postings will only slow the process of down of conducting Q&A. I would now like to introduce the president of ZOA Pittsburgh, <coughs> Jeffrey L. Pollock Esquire. Jeff is a longtime ZOA member and now is in the last year of his third two-year term as president. He is active in many other organizations, both Jewish and secular. Many ZOA members may not know that Jeff has a long list of acting credits in plays, <laughs> TV shows, and TV commercials. We have been very fortunate to have Jeff's leadership at Pittsburgh ZOA. Jeff? I'm turning it over. Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Stuart. I appreciate it. I just left a uh, celebratory 80th birthday dinner to be part of this. I'm really excited about the topic, and I appreciate Jim and Hanna uh, being available for this great uh, event this evening. And I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's discussion on a very important topic. Pittsburgh is ordinarily a community known for sports teams, and we are personally very passionate about our Pittsburgh Steelers. And once every 10 years or so, the, even our pirates go on a winning streak, makes us excited. But with political correctness today, maybe it's not such a good thing to have teams that are named after thieves and pirates. Baruch Hashem for our penguins, our hockey team is named after lovable animals, so we don't go wrong there at least. Sadly, Pittsburgh has also become well known lately uh, for the worst act of Jew hatred in the history of the United States when 11 Jewish souls were massacred at the Tree of Life complex, a short residential block from both the ZOA office, uh, where we were observing Shabbat morning services um, or celebrating Shabbat, and my home, which is only about 200 yards away from Tree of Life. We've all heard about the anti-Israel and anti-Semitism activities going on at college campuses. Tonight, we are going to hear a different story about how anti-Israel BDS supporting college professors and students have made a hostile work environment for a dedicated Jewish professor at Point Park University in Pittsburgh. 
Hannah Newman, PhD, is a Holocaust survivor and has United States, Israeli, and Czech citizenship. She has been employed by Point Park since 1964. Dr. Newman is a professor of French and Cultural Studies and is the chair of the Department of Humanities and Social Studies. But before we hear from her, the stage will be set by her attorney, James Lieber. He has represented individuals and business clients in a practice focused on employment discrimination, commercial litigation, and constitutional law. Mr. Lieber has prevailed at every level of the state and federal courts and was successful twice in arguing cases before the United States Supreme Court. Jim, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, this is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to appear uh, before ZOA. ZOA has been a stalwart in terms of supporting Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, its back is always straight. Uh, Pittsburgh has been, was, is a wonderful community, very diverse. It has been a good home uh, 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 for uh, uh, an, a Jewish community that uh, has, and for the most part, uh, thrived here. Of course, the Tree of Life uh, uh, disaster, massacre, was a, a horrible uh, uh, moment for everyone, but especially the people in Pittsburgh who I think thought that they were uh, uh, living in a, in a safe, decent uh, environment. And to some extent, it, it really still is. At the same time as Tree of Life occurred, October 2018, the first moment of uh, uh, BDS oppression on a university campus occurred at a small college in Pittsburgh called Point Park University. And what happened basically was that one of the finest professors, and also an administrator, department chair, Hannah Newman, at the university, a full professor, uh, uh, was uh, falsely accused of something called a Title IX violation. That means sexual harassment. That is a bullet to the heart of an academic. It can take away the career even of a full professor with tenure. It's the first time that a Title IX sexual harassment charge was ever used in the United States. Uh, and it is, it was insidious. It was anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic and totally false. It was absolutely as false as any frame up case against uh, a Jew from the Dreyfus cases onward. It was awful. And it, it, this is a very small campus it, university. It has very, very few Jewish faculty. It had very few Jewish students. It has no Jewish leadership. It has no Jewish people on its board of trustees. So these people don't even know Jewish people very well. And in, in this very small, in, in this environment of a few thousand people, the frame up involved a, uh, a young woman, an adult, who uh, uh, was very pro BDS. She accused Hannah Newman of some remarks, basically. Uh, the, and then uh, Hannah Newman, without due process, was uh, thrown off the campus, uh, completely cut off while there was an internal investigation where I uh, represented Hannah. Uh, and then uh, the some BDS students and alumni 
uh, uh, became involved in a witch hunt to find any, to, anything against Tana Newman. They were weaponized, and this was on social media. The people who, uh, uh, the professors who helped the complaining victim, or she wasn't a victim, uh, a complainant, uh, to make these charges were uh, uh, avid BDS supporters, including one who is the uh, probably the leading BDS uh, demagogue in this region. Uh, the chances of these types of people coming together in such a small campus are just statistically very, very low, certainly non-random. This was a frame up against someone who is who holds Israeli citizenship the Israel was, is very, very important to Hana and her family. It was their refuge after the Holocaust. Uh, it was just a, a frame up. And, and what was she accused of doing? She was accused at the end of a class by this young woman, I guess she's about 21 years old, in, in, in the, in the uh, fold of, v, of BDS. She said that uh, she, made a statement about the Me Too movement. And she, uh, she said it was uh, her hope that she hoped it would be like the anti-apartheid movement, which was a tip off that BDS was involved because they always go to that particular trope in their slanders against Israel. Uh, and then she said, I, I have been raped, and again, uh, me too is my hope. Hana said, I don't agree that BDS is equivalent to the anti-apartheid movement, and I'm really, I'm sorry, basically, that you, you were raped, and the young woman ran out of class, nothing happened. Hana called her up, and they had a reasonably nice conversation uh, actually, Hana called her and left a voicemail, uh, voicemail, and the woman called Hana back, had a reasonably decent conversation, uh, and then nothing happened, and then the woman didn't return to class. She met with these BDS professors. They filed a formal charge, and Hana was removed. And uh, we fought our way back. The charges were obviously baseless. They don't have anything to do with uh, illegal sexual harassment. Uh, Title IX is meant for serious matters that on the basis of, of, of some type of sexual harassment, like uh, date rape or something like that. There was nothing like that. And uh, so we, we ended up uh, filing claims with the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, and now uh, and then in state court uh, in, in the city of Pittsburgh, uh, Allegheny County, and then those charges were removed uh, uh, by right by Point Park to federal court we are, where we are battling them now. Uh, it was a, a bold uh, play by BDS to use, for the first time, Title IX to destroy a professor. Didn't work, and now we're, we're very much fighting back, taking the offense, showing that uh, uh, this is not <clears throat> something that... Uh, a Jewish uh, Israeli professor could can stand for that the the damage was great, and uh, uh, we're seeking uh, to make changes and to be and for Hana to be made whole. So I don't know if anybody I, I, that's basically uh, uh, the legal approach. There are. Uh, uh, between 15 and 20 counts in this complaint. It's very voluminous. Uh, the facts are extraordinary. Uh, they're complex, but they tell the story 
of a, uh, an insidious attack on uh, a Jewish Israeli professor. There are such attacks, bullying particularly against professors, silencing them, shouting them down uh, all around the country, but to try to destroy somebody like this after so many years of, of particularly uh, good service uh, is, uh, is unprecedented. So, uh, and uh, I guess it's for me now to introduce Hana. Uh, uh, she has been introduced. She is a, uh, uh, a very uh, able, uh, intellectually astute professor. Hana speaks five languages. Uh, she obviously has, she has a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. She has done enormous service to Point Park, was a very, very popular, well-regarded uh, professor until BDS, until these BDS professors got active uh, about, what would you say, eight years ago? Yeah, by, uh, by, two, by 2014 and 15. Yes, and then they, uh, started to uh, turn students against her, uh, students who got into her, into their clutches, then uh, uh, shunned Hana, uh, made false accusations against her, not just this, this one uh, young woman, but others. Uh, she is constantly under some type of investigation at this at this uh, university. Um, and uh, honestly, we feel that the only thing that can stop it is this uh, uh, comprehensive lawsuit. So Hannah, would you, would you? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, you've said a lot, so um, I just have to add that. Speak up. Can, can you hear? Yeah, that um, what happened to me was such a shock that I still can't believe it. I remember the day I was sitting in my office, something odd happened. Uh, somebody called from the office of HR and asked me what my schedule was. And uh, I couldn't understand why they were asking for my schedule. I said it, told them, and they said, perfect. Next I knew was a student asked me, why is our class canceled? And I had no idea. Then I received a call from HR telling me that they need to speak to me. Uh, the head of HR was acting head of Title IX, came to see me in my office. I welcomed her. And this is when I was told, just like that, that I have to leave. A, a file, a, a charge of, charge was filed against me by a student and it has to be investigated and I must leave. And basically, I don't want to retell the whole story because actually it's in, in, in the complaint, but I said, I think this is a setup. It can't be. Nobody listened. I couldn't say a word. I had to get up at that moment, leave, couldn't say goodbye. I had three classes together, all together. I think I was teaching 50 students and everything was going on along perfectly. So that was the end. I mean, I was through, basically I was thrown out and I asked, what is the charge against me? And the only thing I was told is uh, something about me too and a couple of phone calls, that was it. And on the basis of that, and you know, it wasn't until about 10 days later or a week that some kind of an explanation came why this was done to me. Um, so first, I kind of knew at that point, because it was 2018, I knew you know, what was going on. I may have not known that 10 years before, because it would have never, I would have never imagined that this kind of machination and manipulation could take place and actually succeed. But as uh, Jim said, I think there was really in the school not much awareness of anything 
uh, Jewish. So when this person was hired actually by me to teach in my department, in my program, Global Cultural Studies program, um, I didn't realize it took me a little bit to notice that he was teaching almost every course, whether it was called revolutions or um, Southern yeah, uh, uh, political geography of the Middle East, which he introduced and uh, that all of those courses were focusing on Israel, Palestine. And you know, those syllabi are not available. They're available, but they're not handed out. So it take, took a while to realize that in these classes, which were, uh, you know, usually people by students who were majoring in global cultural studies, which is a very open interdisciplinary social science based program that I created, I realized that there was going that they were being indoctrinated basically to just one view, one issue seen from one perspective. And when and I started beginning by 2015, I realized that and I started resisting and protesting from saying to the instructor himself, look, you're not being objective. He denied it. Then I went to the chair. Then I went to the administration. Basically, I was saying I wasn't going to silence him. Uh, you know, once I found out what his position was, very pro-Palestinian, you know, fine, that's his right to do it, to, to take that position. And, uh, and I even supported him. But when it became clear that he was intent on only one message, and he was beginning to do things like limiting his classes to 15 students where it was much easier to really get them hooked. And then he did social media. And then I asked students what kind of exams he gave. And they were telling me that basically there were exams where you could not argue the opposite of what was being preached in the class. So I think that just to summarize my position, it isn't just that as I was resisting this particular, you know, and I hate, you know, I'll use the word fanatic, really, that I was resisting him, I was becoming an enemy, a, a target myself, obviously. And the other thing that I also realized, which really alarmed me to no end, was how easy in a way it was to indoctrinate students. Because later on, those were my students too, who eventually ended up shunning me, those who followed him, you know, without any question. Some were ambivalent, of course, but I also realized when I asked those students what they knew, let's say, about Israel, nothing. They didn't even know that there was a proposed partition in 48. They just started, I think the way he was teaching was two dates, two dates, 48 and 67, and everything pointed to the you know, vile and illegitimate actions, genocide, ethnocide, and so on of the Israelis. And these students have no background in anything. I wanted to have at least another point of view. And every step that was, you know, basically disabled. So eventually I still continued though to challenge um, and when I realized that what this person was doing, especially was using social justice as a cover for anti-Israel propaganda or teaching, if you want to call it that. And so I resisted that and I realized that at some point, or they realized that I'm not going to stop, even though I was the only one. And so in a way, as I look back, I'm not surprised that they took the course that they thought would be the best bet to get rid of me. And that is, you know, as Jim said, using Title IX, where even a tenured professor can get, you know, fired. And of course, I've never done anything. I've never I've been teaching there for over 55 years. I've never had a complaint against me. And it was shocking, or it still is shocking to me, that the administration went along that despite all my complaints and emails, I have stacks of them that I've written to the president, the, the provost, and so on. Nothing was done when I said, what about safety of Jews? There was no response to it. There's concern about the safety of every minority group 
but somehow not the Jews. And uh, that's, I think, is the, the atmosphere in a small school like that. It's very dangerous and it has to be exposed. So I've been hurt terribly and shunned. My reputation really is, is they still continue, some people still continue um, claiming that they need to be protected from me at the school, even though I was vindicated. And uh, my aim is to expose how this kind of thing that is anti-Israel, anti the entire nation of Israel, how that can be, you know, nurtured in a place like this, and how an individual like me can then also be targeted for elimination with, you know, almost impunity. So that's kind of a part of my story. I just want to add one thing that I find so um, striking is I started when I returned to, I created a new course, which I thought, you know, finally somebody has to do something. And it was on prejudice. The title was Prejudice, Women, Jews, Blacks. Because I wanted to do, you know, focus on the groups that historically for the longest period of time were discriminated against. And I was told by the provost to change the title of the course. Otherwise the course will be canceled. And I knew that it was because Jew it did not fit in that title, Jews, by this person who was teaching and by the, as we know, the current, you know, um, trend, the current trend is that Jews are white oppressors, white supremacists, colonialists, and they have no room, no place among victims of prejudice, despite the fact that we see all this anti-Semitism on the rise in this country. And so I had to change the title of the course. Thank you. Um, we will work on assembling the questions here and uh, we'll have a brief pause with a message from ZOA. Many of you know some of ZOA's many successes I mentioned earlier. Currently, we are engaged in a twofold sovereignty campaign, educating Americans about Israel's legal rights in Judea and Samaria and public, public publicity in Israel showing Israelis that we have their backs and support them. Our work is not cheap and could not be made possible without your dedicated uh, memberships. Your financial support facilitates our efforts, which simply would not occur without you. If you hadn't made a 2020 contribution, now is the time to do so. And if you have made a contribution, you may wish to consider an additional contribution. But there is one more way that you can help support ZOA in our efforts. If everyone on this call were to sign up a family member or friend uh, or two uh, as a, a Z, new ZOA members, we could get an, a couple hundred additional members and make a significant difference. To make a donation, there are two ways to do it. If you're in Pittsburgh, simply send an email to pittsburgh at zoa.org and I will get you the information you need. For those around the country, go to our website, zoa.org, and click on the word donate. So now we will uh, get into taking a, a, a few uh, questions, and uh, I've got a couple that are queued up. And um, I, one question that was asked, uh, what, what type of university is Point Park? And I believe it's a, a private university. And um, one thing, uh, Dr. Newman, uh, I don't know, uh, how well um, you expressed it. I was listening carefully, uh, but um, I don't know if it, if it got across that you came to the, your classroom, found it locked, cast classes canceled in the middle of a semester. Would you want to share anything about that? Yeah, I, I wasn't allowed on the day that I came to school, which was a, one of, I think it was, I don't know, Monday, and I was supposed to teach a class at nine o'clock in the morning or 9.30, I was told that the class was canceled before and I couldn't go to the class. So I was in my office and never left my office that day. I couldn't teach and had never left my office to do my duties, in other words, because I was removed that very day without any, uh, 
logical, clear, convincing explanation why I had to be put on indefinite leave. What, uh, what happened to the students whose uh, classes were canceled during the middle of the semester? Uh, the one class that day received at seven in the morning, way before I knew anything, they received a memo from one of the assistant provosts, very cheerful memo. I happened to get a copy of it inadvertently because a student emailed it to me otherwise I would have never known that very day and then email basically said oh be the courageous point park students that you are you're awesome your class is canceled do the work <laughs> that was it okay um jim um in in addition to um uh getting dr newman's reputation restored what kind of uh, changes are, are you looking to get from the university? Well, we would like them, uh, uh, first of all, to uh, uh, train better so that uh, first that anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism uh, uh, are, uh, are not permitted that there would be a zero tolerance. These people don't understand, they, they do train on, you know, certain other types of racial discrimination and uh, gender discrimination, but this is a really big problem. Uh, so we would like them to do that. We certainly would like them to make sure that, that the other point of view uh, uh, is, is per presented at, at Point Park. It's not just that uh, Israel is some sort of uh, uh, settler, colonial, uh, uh, fascist type state, or, and also that it should be, you know, they, this, they teach that it should be delegitimized, de de that there shouldn't be a Jewish state. Uh, so, I mean, that's, our government even says the Department of State and the Department of Education, they say that's anti-Semitism, and it is. Uh, so there has to be, there has to be a, a different point of view presented. There has to be more training. Uh, uh, and that, so, and, and this thing about the misuse of Title IX is a horrible thing. And there was uh, last year, uh, a full professor at Dartmouth was named very peripheral, peripherally in a Title IX suit. Uh, and uh, uh, that made him a pariah on the campus and in the community. He was considered anti-women, uh, anti-feminist, uh, and he killed himself. I mean, this is a, in, in this era of political correctness, to level a Title IX charge baselessly is a horrible thing to do. And they almost got away with it at Point Park. There, has to, there have to be controls. There has to be due process. There has to be fairness. And our courts are starting to, are starting to say that. And that's, uh, we're encouraged actually by the, uh, the, the change in the law that has uh, started to um, uh, address this kind of politically correct uh, uh, fanaticism. Uh, so we're standing up against those things. Uh, it's, it's not easy, especially in a place like Point Park where uh, there is almost no uh, Jewish, much less Israeli presence. And uh, these people are very receptive uh, to a, uh, a slanted, uh, uh, bigoted, anti-Jewish, anti-Israeli perspective. Uh, just a couple quick questions for Jim before I get back to Dr. Newman. Jim, if I remember correctly, um, Point Park didn't even follow their own rules and regulations on, on how they handled the situation. Well, that's, that's, that's pretty true. Um, and they handled it 
they they have had real <laughs> Title IX cases at Point Park uh, uh, involving men, always unfortunately that who have uh, 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 done things that are sexually inappropriate, and not one of them was removed from the campus. And the, the rule at Point Park is that, that if there is a Title IX violation and it's not uh, a chance that it's criminal, that there should, they should try to have an informal resolution without such a severe sanction. But that wasn't tried in this case. Uh, Hanna Newman never got to confront her accuser, confront the evidence against her. It was, uh, it, it was uh, a pretty much of a Kafka-esque, I say that because she's, she's from Czechoslovakia, uh, situation. And, uh, or she's from the Czech Republic now. She was, we used to be Czechoslovakia, obviously. Um, so this is, uh, this is difficult, but it, it's, it's necessary. And, uh, um, I think the, the, the Jewish community and the uh, uh, stood up magnificently after um, uh, Tree of Life uh, and it has, but when there's real anti-Semitism, real anti-Zionism, we, we have to stand up uh, before people are totally destroyed. Okay. Um Jim, uh, like most colleges, Point Park must get a little federal money. Um, is, are they under any kind of federal investigation or anything? Uh, at this point, no. It's possible that they will be. At this point, it's really on us to, uh, uh, to get the truth and to, to hopefully uh, 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 redress this problem. Okay, uh, Dr. Newman, uh, there's been a few questions. People want to know if any of your students stood up for you or if other professors stood up for you. A, a, a few students uh, alerted me to the fact that on the very day that I was, you know, uh, told to leave the school, one of the students who was a BDS follower too, started a chat room where she contacted former students in my department and basically urged them to help the Title IX investigation by t trying to bring up any uh, objections that they could find about me by my entire teaching so that they could uh, uh, investigate and punish me as I deserve to be punished. And there were students in that group who argued against it, that, oh, she's really good and so on. But they were graduate, they already were gone. And as it turned out that in the school, nobody was told anything. So the class, for example, all the classes where the students, you know, pretty much were happy um, in, in that class, none of them were told what happened. No one knew what happened. Even my department was not told. No one in my department was told what happened. I just disappeared. And they were afraid, actually. So nobody, nobody really, only, only my adjuncts who are foreign, one from Yemen and one was from Libya. Actually, you know, my, my Arab adjuncts, they stood by me and, and another one from Turkey. So they're the ones who contacted me and actually were outraged that I disappeared. But basically, you know, and no one else, because immediately something was set into motion, or, which is why I was so terrified, because I thought, this is it, they're replacing me. My department was told that somebody else, who wasn't very friendly to me anyway, was appointed as interim chair for my department, which was really kind of a, a radical thing to do. And it was done without consulting anyone in my department, even though there were two former chairs in my department. So basically it was so brutal that I think even those who may have seen and noticed it didn't know what to do. And students knew nothing. So they didn't do anything. 
two questions um, that have come up. Uh, one, are you tenured and uh, have you been restored to your position? Yes, I, I am tenured. And when I returned, uh, I returned to my chairmanship and, in, and my, you know, regular duties. However, your duties were reduced. The, yeah, but, but I was under scrutiny and my position was undermined in all sorts of ways that I don't want to enumerate right now. But I mean, I'll give you an example. Students were allowed to go behind my back, my majors, you know, in my department and graduate with a degree in global cultural studies without fulfilling the requirements for graduation. And any time there's any substitution, the chair has to sign off on it. I was completely bypassed with the approval of the administration. And so it's very difficult, still continues. And the students who were um, basically already indoctrinated to anti-Israel feelings were ambivalent. You know, even if they had to take my class, they didn't seem to want to. And I think that they were collateral damage. So my program is in shambles, basically. And those students who graduated know nothing. And it's not a very healthy situation for the program that I created. And there was a thriving program before BDS, you know, took hold of it. We have a question, um, and I can answer part of it, is that, that I... I know that you've received a lot of, of support in the uh, in our local Jewish press, the Pittsburgh Jewish Chronicle. How have you have you received any support or publicity in the secular press? It's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some coverage uh, in our uh, main newspaper, which is the uh, Pittsburgh Post Gazette but it was very abstract, very tepid, uh, didn't mention anything about the uh, anti-Semitism in the case. And there hasn't been much follow-up from the mainline press. We've, we've made some attempts to uh, uh, get the word out, but uh, they, I'm not sure that it's not that they're not interested or whether it's COVID-19 or what it is, but uh, uh, it, it, there, are, there isn't much coverage in the mainline press. At this okay. Point. And uh, uh, Dr. Newman, the, the course uh, on the, the title of the course on prejudice was changed. Did that make a difference uh, in, to the students or in teaching class? Uh, no, I thought the class the way I would have anyway, but the difference was that it wasn't canceled. So it was called, I ended up calling it just prejudice. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, it's not a disaster, but it's just that it was, I knew what it meant, the demand to have it. An anonymous complaint, again, I wasn't told who. I wasn't allowed to discuss it with anyone. And I knew I did ask a few faculty members in another department. I asked them, look at this title. Could you tell me, because I'm kind of puzzled. Is there any word in that title that you might object to? And it was women, Jews, blacks. And yeah, they said Jews. They said it wouldn't bother me, but I think that people would think that maybe Jews don't belong with blacks and women because they're not. So, you know, uh, that was clear to me, but I taught the course the way I would have taught it anyway. Okay, and, and you were banned from the, the campus for, for how long? About two and a half months, I think. Okay. From October 16th till December. It's about two months. Yeah, two months. Okay. And, and and does anybody uh, at the university uh, teach any uh, other uh, classes about the Holocaust? No. 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 I think there was once a course taught by someone, and I was actually surprised because it was not someone who had any, you know, experience. 
Okay. Um, okay. You know, I mean, I, that was that was a long time ago, but that's that's it. Um, and uh, a question about uh, in the investigation, um, did did you learn who was behind this? And and from my understanding, uh, and I, I think what you mentioned, there were a couple of uh, pro BDS professors that were kind of orchestrating things in the background. Is that, is that correct? One especially, right. One who was actually a trained, trained in advocacy, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, he was trained in uh, uh, BDS and Israel-Palestine mission advocacy. I, I didn't know that when he started teaching there, but that was actually his aim. I think that how to introduce BDS to campus is something that appears in some of those manuals. And I think that now that I look back, I see that basically this was kind of a plan that was put into practice by this particular, you know, um, professor. And, um, and I know from my reading that uh, besides being uh, pro BDS, that this professor is uh, a member of the uh, American Friends of Sabeel. And, right. and he's also uh, uh, involved with his uh, religious congregation um, that is uh, notoriously uh, anti-Israel. Right. Okay. Um, is, is there anything that the public can do to help you, Dr. Newman, or, 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 or Jim, uh, with the, with the individually or with the case or anything? Sure. Uh, uh, the, the public could uh, keep the light on uh, and uh, uh, follow the case, uh, um, ask questions of Point Park um, and the administration. And one of the things that, Stuart, that you, you raised is you know, who was involved in this? Well, unfortunately, uh, members of the administration also were involved uh, and uh, uh, were, were not controlled. Um, I think that uh, it's really important, not just at Point Park, but at all colleges and universities for uh, uh, there to be uh, uh, really a, a, a safe space for uh, Jewish, pro-Zionist, and Israelis, and so that they're not shunted to the side. The public has to, has to make that happen, uh, both at public and private universities, because I mean, what I see today is that uh, many uh, Jewish people uh, in universities don't even want to be known as being Jewish. Um, it's, it's politically incorrect. And uh, uh, the public has to be, and Jewish people too, have to be mobilized so that that form of, of anti-Semitism uh, can't exist in, in our colleges and universities, which are, of course are, are such important uh, uh, training grounds for uh, uh, every generation. Um, but uh, I think that there has been a, uh, unfortunately, uh, a tolerance of people for this form of uh, bullying and oppression and silencing. And uh, in Hannah Newman's case, really uh, elimination, uh, ruination until, but actually people in, in Pittsburgh uh, stood up. And uh, I think that uh, uh, it would be more difficult to do this at Point Park there was in the in the Pittsburgh Jewish Chronicle, and I'm sure Jeff and Stewart, you saw this. The president of uh, of Point Park 
uh, wrote a column and actually said that BDS was a form of anti-Semitism and it wouldn't be tolerated. Now, I don't know if that's going to be the case or not, but uh, to some extent, it seems like uh, he was sensitized. I think that I was just going to add that what is necessary, I have learned from this that there is much more action that is required by the Jewish community and by Jewish professors. And I, I, I would, in my teaching in the future, I'm going to make sure that misinformation that is routinely now fed to students is countered. So wherever I can, when I teach like languages of the world, I will make mention of, let's say, the Hebrew language and, and try to bring into you know, the, their consciousness some of the things that are being destroyed by the, by the new trends to nullify everything that is uh, historically you know, Jewish proven. One of the things that BDS did at Point Park and does, does elsewhere is it sort of draws a line between what it considers good Jews and bad Jews. And the good Jews are the ones who will uh, stand up against Israel uh, and uh, 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 advocate for a secular state, uh, 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 which of course would be the end of Israel. And, and uh, um, that's very prevalent on campuses today. Uh, and there has to be some type of, it seems to me, that uh, uh, there has to be some, some uh, voice that counters that. Um, and, but we'll see. I mean, it's been going on for a while. Nobody tried to do, uh, no BDS chapter uh, or group. It's not, they're not organized as, I guess maybe they are sometimes organized as chapter. Uh, no, no BDS group or organization ever tried to do to any other professor what happened to Hannah Newman. And uh, fortunately, uh, uh, she didn't do what they wanted her to do, which would have been to quit in disgrace as a uh, uh, someone who is a, a pervert, uh, a, a sexual harasser of a young student. That's what the charge actually was. Uh, she wasn't driven off the campus. She stood up, she fought back, and she continues to do that. Uh, Jim, this, this next question you may be uncomfortable with, I don't know, uh, but uh, do you think uh, this is uh, driven by Jew hatred? And uh, also, what is uh, the status of the lawsuit at the present time? Uh, is it driven by Jew hatred? I don't know that... It, it, it's certainly driven by the hatred of a certain type of Jew. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's driven by the hatred of the notion of a Jewish uh, state, which is seen as a, a colonial oppressor uh, and not legitimate. Uh, it, I would say that that is anti-Semitic. Um, uh, so, that, that's, I mean, it's not, it's not as much the classical type of anti-Semitism where uh, 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 Jews are uh, uh, seen as, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Wall Street bankers and things like that. Although there was, a, there's some interesting stuff at the point, in, at Point Park. Uh, uh, after Hana came back to campus, there was an article about it in the, uh, in the student newspaper. And uh, uh, the, uh, some students who were very highly critical of Hana anonymously and a, 
um, an assistant provost were interviewed and they said that uh, um, uh, because of the, what happened with Hana and the way that I guess she taught and then was removed, that the students felt cheated financially. It was very awkward, very awkward and, and seems uh, uh, like some, some version of, of, of more or less classic or traditional anti-Semitism. Uh, Hannah uh, um, brought the, actually raised the rape charge uh, to an official at the university um, who didn't even take it. Uh, and this woman reportedly uh, uh, in, a, in a, she's a, an administrator in one of her office meetings, apropos of nothing, but at the same time, she spoke of, of her student experience and having a little Jewish roommate who was afraid of everything. Now, I mean, that's a, that's a painful uh, um, slur. Uh, and at the same time, when, the, when Hannah was uh, thrown off campus uh, uh, in a meeting, uh, uh, she's basically laughing about it and, and uh, meeting about it with one of these, uh, or in a meeting that where it came up with one of these uh, uh, BDS profs, professors. Um, so it's, it's, it's concerning. Do I think, and I do think that it, it is anti-Semitic, at least in terms of the Department of the United States Department of State and Department of Education definitions. Could I, I want to add something. You know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of it is ignorance. And when you have, you know, people have written about this, you know, there's, you have kind of a, a low level, low grade anti-Semitism that is part of the culture. And then you tap into it through, you know, this kind of visual and inciting, you know, emotionally arousing horrible things that Israel does to the Palestinians. And that mobilizes students, especially students who have no friends who are Jewish, who don't know anyone, you know, from some areas in Pittsburgh, especially. So Point Park is a fertile ground, if you're not paying attention, for mobilizing students, you know, to the cause of, you know, demonizing Israel. Yes, I, I've experienced that firsthand myself by attending a BDS meeting at uh, on the Pitt campus. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Newman, one last uh, question. Um, this uh, this, this uh, BD, pro BDS professor, which has been causing the, the, the crux of the problem, um, th this came as a, a kind of a total surprise to you since you had hired him mm -hmm. to, the, to be part of the department. Right. Uh, because he misrepresented himself and was totally on board with the program in my department until about, you know, a couple of years. I think that maybe right after he got tenure, I can't remember exactly, he began, you know, almost actually at the beginning, he wanted to take students. So I encouraged travel abroad and he wanted to take students to the Sabra and Shatila camps in Lebanon which I thought was odd, you know? And I said, why don't you, if you want to teach the Middle East, why don't you take students to Israel and Jordan? Uh, no, I think he said something like, uh, my Hezbollah friends are not gonna talk to me if I take students to Israel. So I think that's when I started catching on, but still there was a denial and he has academic freedom too. You know, he can, he can teach that. So there's, and I didn't object to his position even, but why I ended up objecting is basically using it in this horrible way, A, to, to eliminate me and B, to indoctrinate a whole bunch of innocent students who came there to study, to hate, 
you know, and as I even said that, I mean, we're not supposed to be a place that fosters and foments hate, but that's kind of what ended up happening. And I caught on, not immediately. Well, uh, Dr. Newman, I, I want to thank you very much. Um, I want to add you. for, oh, you're most welcome. Um, I want to add for the edif edification of the uh, viewers from around the country, ZOA members, uh, about the local uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette did very well. They made, they made a lot of money after covering the shooting, the massacre at the uh, uh, Tree of Life complex. Uh, big papers every day for two, three weeks. But the paper has, has not been friendly uh, to Israel and the Jewish community. Just last week, there was an editorial by a local columnist about Middle Eastern countries and what's, what's going on with a peace or not a peace process. Something like 139 words out of 550 were about Israel, like 31%. And in addition, they put this huge picture of the prime minister with an Israeli flag behind him. So they, they create a bias right from the get-go, and uh, maybe some lesser educated readers might not even uh, notice that. I immediately fired off a letter to the editor. Not only was my letter not printed, but there was not one letter uh, against the editorial printed. And it, it would shock me if I was the only one in the Jewish community that, um, that had written a letter. Uh, Dr. Newman, I, we, you know, we all feel so terrible for what you've gone through. It's just, it, your story is incredible. And, uh, and this, uh, may Hashem give you and Jim strength in, in fighting the, the university uh, for your rights and for uh, creating a, a positive uh, environment on campus. I want to uh, take a moment and tell our viewers about uh, upcoming programs. Uh, this coming Monday, July 20th at 1 p.m., we have the Farhud Roots of the Arab Nazi Alliance in the Holocaust, featuring best-selling uh, actor uh, Edwin Black. That's a the July 20th at 1 p.m., and it's gonna be moderated by our Florida director, Sharona Whistler. On Wednesday, July 29th at 1 p.m., uh, the ZOA Book Club is, is hosting a program called Tikkun Alum, Israel versus COVID-19, how, how one of the planet's smallest countries is uh, helping tackle the world's biggest challenge, featuring author Jody Cohen and moderated by our own Liz Burney. And then uh, once uh, again with Liz Burney on Wednesday, August 5th at 1 p.m., uh, she will be hosting uh, a, a talk. Uh, the book is titled Israel, The Will to Prevail, and, and the author is uh, Am Ambassador Danny Danone. So that would be a, a really exciting uh, program. I want to I thank um, my colleagues who uh, are on this call, Alan Jay, Steve Feldman, Jackie Schaefer, who have been doing all the hard lifting in the background. And I want to thank everybody who is uh, on this call uh, for taking the time to be with us this evening. And we look forward to seeing you at another event in the near future. Thank you and good evening.